without further ado, I'd like to introduce the author of the book, Dancing with the Muse in Old Age, Priscilla Long. Yeah, so thanks right. for coming out, you all, uh, or staying in, I guess you're staying in, and <laughs> and, and coming um, to, to this. And um, yeah, and so I, you've seen the, I guess you've seen the cover. I want to, I love the cover. And it's by um, Carol Nelson, who's an artist in her late 70s. And uh, um, so I, I wrote the book because I'm, oh, the cover, it's called um, Crossroads. And it's a little artwork um, that I actually bought and I have it. Um, so um, I wrote this book because I'm 79, I'm going to be 80. And I feel I am at a crossroads or uh, maybe at the threshold of old age is more, more like it. And I wanted to enter this era of this new era of my life in a proactive way, partly knowing the science. And there's a lot of new science in the, in the last five years. Um, quite a lot of new science. And also I felt I needed to have role models of people who are old and dynamic and old and active and old and creative and old and connected to community. So, um, and so I wanna explain why do I use the word old? Because I mean, it's not <laughs> the most <laughs> in use word that we have. Um, because for one thing, I like the word, I'm a poet and an old soul, old English. So there's that. And this book is against ageism. And um, so I think the reason why people like the word young, but don't like the word old is we like to be young, but not to be old. I like to be, I like old, I like to be old. And also there's a say your age movement, which you can find on Instagram, I think, where you have your picture and then there's your age. And that's an anti-ageism movement. And so I'm part of that. Although granted, there's a lot of age discrimination. And so um, some people, you know, perhaps rightly don't wanna um, say their age. So I wrote this book for myself, um, first of all. But secondly, I wrote it for everyone over 40. <laughs> and, and thirdly, I wrote it for everyone under 42. <laughs> um, because, but why? Because um, part of the new science is um, Becca Levy at the Yale School of Public Health has done all of these longitudinal studies about um, uh, uh, about attitudes toward aging. And people who have negative attitudes toward aging and toward old people and toward their own aging. Um, and I mean, 20 year olds who have negative attitudes have a much, have seven years shorter to live. They have a much greater, um, you know, um, um, possibility of cardiac um, stroke and dementia. And so I feel that this, this book is really, um, you know, important for, for, for us all. And so now I wanna, I wanna put the slideshow up. Um, yeah, and feel so, free to uh, ask questions as uh, Priscilla is speaking and I will yeah. uh, direct uh, the questions to her. Okay, here we go with the slideshow. Um, and okay, let me see if this is working. No, it's working. We see it. That's working. Okay, so um, there's the cover. Um, so uh, and and so I so I want to talk about some key points about science, and I want to show you some of the the. Um, role models that I found. But I mean, there's so many more. I mean, there are many in the book. There's probably a hundred different people in the book. Um, and there's, of course, many more outside the book. Um, and ever si actually, since the book was published two weeks ago, all kinds of people have been sending me more examples of these 
uh, these really uh, people you would envy um, and and admire and wish you could be like that too. So um, so the point is um, that um, we can't. We know we can't control our fates. We know that. I mean, for one thing, we don't know how long we have, um, but we can have a huge influence in our lives toward flourishing well-being. So, okay. I, I want to move my picture away from the caption. Um, so this is Don Pellman. He became the first person older than 100 to run 100 meters in fewer than 20 seconds. 27 seconds. And he also has world records in long jump, high jump, discus throw, and pole vault. This is for people over 100. And what's funny, I think, or interesting anyway, is that while he was achieving these world records, he was living in assisted living. I'm not quite sure what they were assisting him with, but probably, hopefully, good food. And so people say, yeah, yeah, sure, but what's the competition? Well, actually, there's quite a bit of competition. Okay, here this happened. Where it doesn't shift. Okay, wait a second here. Um, this is um, Sister Madonna Buder. Um, and she is called the Iron Nun. She's out here in the West, on the West Coast in Spokane. And she, by her late eighties, she had competed in 400 triathlons, 45 of them Ironmans, which is you swim 2.4 miles, bike 112 miles, run 26.2 miles. However, now that she's in her nineties, she has slowed down and her daily routine is swim half a mile, bike for 20 miles and run for three miles. So, um, like I'm showing these athletes and I am the world's most unathletic person. <laughs> and my favorite sport is reading Dickens, actually. I can't catch a ball. I am not drawn to sports, but I can use them as models because they follow their dreams and they they train. They didn't say, well, I'm too old. I, I can't do this, I'm too old. Um, they And they they took the steps that they needed to take in order to do this. And so we don't all, of course, have to be become athletes or even or even join a gym. Um, but people, we have to move more. The science is overwhelming. Um, we have to walk more, um, do weights twice a week, um, starting so many, perhaps we're already doing this. So um, I am not very, as I said, I'm not athletic. I'm not drawn to sports, um, but I have bonded to my Fitbit and I now walk 10,000 steps a day and um, do yoga twice a week and weights twice a week. And it, it um, is, I don't, I find it fine. It's pleasurable, actually. Um, my favorite statistic, there are numbers of statistics in the book some of them depressing and others, you know, interesting. But this is one of my favorites. A quarter of marathon runners in their 60s can be expected to outperform more than half of their competitors between 20 and 54. So that's interesting. In other words, things are really changing. In other words, um, people aren't saying, well, now I have to stop running. Um, or because I'm too old, or I have to stop dancing because, you know, when you're 40 year old as a dancer, um, things are changing. So that's that's really good. Let me see if this now, um, yeah. Um, this is Wayne Thibault. He was a California painter who just died last year. Um, this is him at 100 years old. And he started a new body of work um, at age 98. And so, uh, and so another piece of the science is that um, another way to achieve flourishing well-being in old age is to have something you're passionate about to the point that it takes you about three hours a day to carry it out. Um, so what I have to say about this is it's 
not necessary to feel passionate all every minute. That isn't what it's about. It's that you, you know, persistently you open this area of work, whatever it is, it's writing poetry, it's painting, it's um, designing your garden or whatever it is. And it's the work that gives you back. It gives back um, for those who are persistent and keep at it. And also any endeavor that we undertake has a community that goes with it. Um, and so, and this sounds contradictory right here, what I'm going to say now, but a great advantage um, of being old is that older people tend to care less about the opinions of others. And actually, this is a great um, advantage in doing uh, any kind of making of anything because you're 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 focused on the artwork or the thing you're working on. You're focused on it. What does it need? You're not focused on what will so and so think. Will this be any good? So um, and here are his. This is a Wayne Tebow clown. And here's another Wayne Tebow clown. Um, Wayne Tebow said, "Working becomes your own little Eden." You make this little spot for yourself. You don't have to succeed. You don't have to be famous. You don't have to be obligated to anything except the, that development of the self. So this is Alma Thomas. I don't know if you, you know her work or not. Um, she, um, uh, she died in 1978, but there were there's been a couple of big exhibitions in Washington D.C. of her work, and uh, she was a superb painter and colorist. And by the end of her life, she had an international reputation. Um, so, like 15 percent of the world's people, which the uh, World Health Organization says, um, she was quite disabled. Um, by the time she got to be 70, she was very disabled with arthritis. And um, she was not exactly a late starter um, because she was trained in art, but then like some others, um, she then spent several decades um, teaching art to children. And she said about that, I enjoyed those 35 years. I devoted my life to the children and I think they loved me. Um, at 72, she was offered a retrospective. And so she got very busy. And um, even though at that time she was recovering from a severe bout with um, arthritis, she began madly painting. And that's that's one of her paintings. Um, and um, in her early 80s, she broke a hip and she would paint with a painting on her lap. And then toward the end, she would have she had this system of of uh, wedging herself so she could stand, so she could paint um, bigger. And she said, do you see this painting? Look at it move, that's energy. And I'm the one who put it there. I transform energy with these old limbs of mine. And I mentioned that she was disabled and there's of course Matisse in his wheelchair. I mention this because um, there might be an idea that if you're disabled, you can't be a world-class artist. And so, um, no, um, Matisse who began his famous cutout series and his jazz um, after he was, uh, he had um, this, operation and he couldn't he had to be in his wheelchair so um and then this is um eve eva zeisel i think you pronounce her name and she was a um industrial designer and she um was uh, she so she was hungarian born um she has spent she had spent time in the soviet union actually she spent time in the soviet in a stalinist um prison for a while and she eventually got out she eventually got to the united states and she had the first all woman um show uh at moma um so and 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 she uh she she makes oops she makes these um 
she made these like vases, uh, domestic, you know, objects, balls, plates, um, vases, and things like that. And they were then they were mass produced. Um, she became blind from macular degeneration, and she continued to work. And somebody asked her, "Is it more difficult to work blind?" And she said, "The process getting shapes out of air is always the same." And this is Sarah Yerkes, who um, published her first book of poems after the age of 100. I think my idea of age after doing all this research has really changed. Like 79 is nothing. <laughs> um, uh, so she, like, uh, here's uh, another sort of typical move. Um, she was a sculptor, and before that, she was a landscape designer. And um, in her 90s, she was no longer able to handle the heavy materials. Um, so she turned to poetry. And that's very um, characteristic of these old artists and old creators. They don't stop. They change medium to, to what they can um, handle. And she also found um, uh, a community with other poets in her, she lives in a senior living place. So um, she said, in this poetry workshop I started going to, it was because I liked the people who were in the group. A lot of people in life, as well as at the Ingleside, which is her place, have done so many other different kinds of things, but they haven't been wildly creative. So when a group of potential soulmates turns up, I join them. And so I think this brings us to the issue of connection with others and how essential this is for our well-being and thriving all through life, but in particular in old age. And so I want to bring up the topic of loneliness um, because it's often brought up. Um, and so, and we know that um, uh, chronic loneliness is very, very dangerous. It's supposed to be as bad as drunk driving. Um, and we do not want our teenager to be lonely. We do not want our college student to be lonely. We do not want our divorce. And I'm talking about chronic loneliness. I mean, if your best friend dies, of course, you're going to be lonely. That's, that's natural. But chronic loneliness, um, we don't want our divorced brother or sister in their 40s or ourselves to be chronically lonely. And we don't want to be lonely as old people. And um, the thing that happens um, as you age, as many of you, I can't see you, so I don't have any guess as to how old you are. <laughs> but but um, what happens um, is, I'm sure you already know, is that um, the dear friends of our life start predeceasing us. So I'm only 79 and I have lost something like 15 people already. I mean, dear people, dear to me that have known me for decades and I've known them for decades. So um, my thought about this is that it's really important to be um, proactive in going out and connecting with people and with new people and with in, in um, um, cross generations um, actually too. But the other um, side to this is there's a stereotype about loneliness and old people. I mean, the Meals on Wheels ad, I don't know if you've seen it, it shows this lonely man and about how old people are lonely. I mean, it's just, it's actually, I mean, it's true there are lonely old people, which is very sad and should not be, but it's also true that's a stereotype of old age because it's also true that um, the there's a happiness, um, the U curve of happiness where, and this is study after study, after study, after study, young people are happy and old people are happy. Middle-aged people have a lot of stress, you know, for, and for good reasons. But anyway, um, so, um, so old people are happy. One of my chapters is the happiness of the old. Um, this, the book has a lot of creators in it, but also has other types of people. So this is Bob Halberstadt. He is a firefighter at age 85. 
um, he enjoys fighting fires and he enjoys the community and he enjoys the, I guess he enjoys the excitement and the, some uh, amount of the danger. And this is Angela Glendening, who um, is British. And she says she doesn't have a, um, a creative bone in her body. She doesn't paint, she doesn't draw, she doesn't write, she doesn't do pottery, she doesn't do jewelry, she doesn't garden, she doesn't do any of that, but she works for social justice and to help people. And so she says, my current commitment is to an asylum and refugee charity, and she names the charity, it's over in England, Getting to know asylum seekers from all over the world enriches my life. I've always been most at home working with people who have fallen on hard times and who are struggling with life. They are my inspiration and keep me going. Besides, what else could I do? Um, and um, now, one of the most important things, and that one of the really new things that I've learned comes from neuroscientist Rachel Wu and her team. And they study um, co cognitive agility across the life uh, lifespan. And so their big point is it's not about maintenance, it's about cognitive development. So if it's great if a person likes to do crossword puzzles that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, if that's fun. But um, it's it's about cognitive development, which is a lot more than crossword puzzles. And they find that it, this works the same in older people as it does in children. And so we know what that is. And and I will run down the, the steps um, um, also in a minute. Um, they think that so middle aged people. Um, you know, you're holding down a job, maybe you're holding down two jobs, you're keeping your household organized, you probably you may have teenagers at this point, um, you may be taking care of parents. And basically, you're running on your native brilliance and your experience, and you're not learning too much. I mean, that's their that's their um, idea. And so, you know, and you don't have time, so get off my back. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Um, but that changes. And so um, the two ways to influence whether or not you stay sharp are moving and learning, learning and moving, moving and learning, learning and moving. So next week, <laughs> you have the exercise, is it next week? You have the um, exercise um, uh, thing. So the new science is not that new. I mean, it's about 30 years old now that we know the brain is plastic. The old person's brain is plastic. The hippocampus um, can generate stem cells in old brains. And every time you learn something, new connections are made and your brain thickens and your hippocampus thickens. And so that's new information, I mean, in the, in the past 30 years, and that's the good news. And the bad news is though, that the brain is also plastic the other way. If you sit around doing nothing and learning nothing and your, your, your connections die, your neurons die, the brain shrinks, the hippocampus shrinks, and that's all of that is not good. So, um, so they have outlined um, what are the steps required for cognitive development. And this is your entering a new, some new learning, some new piece of learning. Um, you know, everyone talks about learn a language, learn a new instrument, um, go back for uh, another master's degree um, or whatever. Um, so they have, have um, put down these steps. Um, one, you're learning from the immediate environment. You're not going on past experience. Um, you're going, you're learning new things. Um, individual scaffolding. So that means like you master one, the early part, then you master, you master the first part, then you master the second part, then you master the next part. Unlike when I was in elementary school and I was terrible at math and I 
I didn't get half of third grade math. So then in the fourth grade, I was even worse off. And then in the fifth grade, I was even worse off. So um, to individual scaffolding. And of course, at this point, we can learn at our own pace. Absolutely. Um, very slowly, if we wish to learn slowly, that's totally fine. I mean, why not? Um, a growth mindset, um, the belief that abilities are not fixed or limited, they develop from the effort and dedication of the learner. In other words, if you think you are too old to learn, you were right. <laughs> but if you think that you can learn, yes, you can. Um, and so, and then for a forgiving and supportive environment, um, non-perfectionist, seeing mistakes as part of learning, and then five, um, a serious commitment to learning. In other words, they say eschew a hobbyist approach, and I'm not sure I love that, that the way they put down hobby. But in any case, it means that any new endeavor, um, it's usually exciting at first, and then you get to the rocky place. And um, uh, so the idea is to keep going through that rocky place. And as a writer and a poet, of course, there are like numbers of rocky places, but you just keep going through them instead of quitting at that point. Um, and that's any, any new skill, I would say. And then um, they say learning multiple skills at the same time, the way children do, which is interesting to me. Um, I wouldn't have expected that one. Um, and so this gentleman here, um, this is um, Giuseppe Paterno. He's Italian. He um, was from a working class Italian family and he had to quit school in the eighth grade, after the eighth grade to, to go to work. He always loved to read. Um, and he actually, he spent his career um, as a surveyor for the Italian railroad. And so at age 93, he applied to college and he was accepted. And after a month, he went, he was just like went to the Dean and said, is this right? I mean, all of these other students are so young. <laughs> should I really be doing this? And the Dean said, yes, you should be doing this. And so within a short amount of time, everyone got used to everyone else and it was just normal to have him and everyone else. Um, and so he graduated at the top of his class um, in history and philosophy. And he said the following, my time at university has changed me for certain. It's as if my brain has evolved. I've started to speak a different language. If I'm discussing the newspaper with my friends, I can articulate myself with greater precision. I'm still the same man I've been coming up to a century with just a few minor upgrades. But that that's like um, mental sharpness right there. I mean, that's cognitive development. Um, so I want to talk a little bit um, about memory, um, and which is, um, it's a kind of a complicated subject, and I go into it a fair amount in the book. Um, it is found that people living in communities where elders are highly respected, um, which is not our mainstream uh, American society, um, such as traditional Chinese communities in China, that's one um, and the American deaf community is another. The memories of elders are the same as the memories of the youngers. That's very interesting. And also they've done all kinds of um, experiments with um, where the subjects of various ages are primed with positive and negative words having to do with aging. Primed meaning they're they're flashed so fast that you um can't um you can't consciously know what they are but you're they're in your head, um so the ones primed with negative words no matter their age, they remember less well, they walk slower to the elevator and their handwriting is um, shakier and interesting. So Here's a question uh, from the audience that might be relevant. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. There's so much discussion lately about whether Joe Biden should run for re-election. And so uh, many people say he's too old that he's getting senile, which I disagree, said the person. Uh, how can this message 
an opinion be countered? Well, I think it's ageism unless he is getting Alzheimer's, um, which of course Ronald Reagan was did um, and in office. But but how can it be countered? Um, you know, I think there's just a lot of work to be done in countering age. That's just plain old ageism. Um, uh, you know, I he's too old to be president. You know, I'm too old to write a novel. I mean, it's the same exact thing. Um, and so how to counter it? I think the work is in countering um, ageism. Um, is he competent? You know, um, that's the question. That is, is he competent? Is he carrying out policies that we think are good? Those are the questions. The question isn't how old is he? So I don't know the answer. What's could you? What is your answer? <laughs> oh, you you're asking the person to type in. Yeah. Their yeah. Answer. Okay. I mean, I, it's a discussion. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we can talk later. Yeah, with, or you could raise your hand and. Uh, yeah. Let you or other other people could put in their their. I I can't see this the the chat so because I have the the slideshow up so, but um yeah so you know um uh, I think that um it's a long I I think that it's a long road in working against stageism is a long long road. Um, but it has definitely started, and it has it it it's um, uh, it, it has many aspects. Um, and I think, for example, um, Ashton Applewhite is doing terrific work, and I think you already know her, right? Because she got one of your prizes. Um, so, um, mm -hmm. and it's just um, for and uh, so, for example. Um, back to expectations and i mean the first the first people to work against ageism is in ourselves because we are all saturated with it i mean we are uh, i am um and so um i'm suggesting that for example we drop the um the phrase senior moment because senior moment it fuses age with forgetting and that's just not it's not good science, okay? It's not good science at all. Um, so, um, so now at this point, I thought we could we open to questions, even though I can't see the questions. <laughs> um, for or and then or I could just keep on. Yeah. Uh, are there any questions? You can put them in the chat, or you can raise your hand, and we will let you ask your question with your voice. Here's one. Where can we find new ideas to try to enhance our lives? Um, I think it like you cast around for what what are your interests? What are your old interests that you never um, followed through or you sort of lost as life took over at one point or, or another? Or what are your, um, you know, what could you go into now i mean it's about opening doors to new um friendships and new uh endeavors um that aren't just the same as before so um for example um uh what's her name i'm gonna forget her name uh lawrence lightfoot a social harvard sociologist um she did a study where she didn't name the people but she did a study of people who, um, cha they changed careers, I guess you would say, um, from what they were good at and they had done for decades in order to follow their old dreams. And so, uh, for example, um, one of her people had, was, had a career in public health. And, and he was like very, you know, high status person. And, but he'd always dreamed of being an opera singer. And his mother had always taught him that opera singing is for sissies. So he never got to do it. So at age 70, he started secretly taking singing lessons and opera singing, that type of thing. Um, I think it's just, uh, it's not, um, it's to get past business as usual, especially if you have some time now. Is that an 
an answer. <laughs> no, that but, sounds great. And uh -huh. um, uh, one person wrote, we all need good social collections, but some of us have medical problems and can't get out to meet people. Do you have some ideas about keeping and increasing social contacts when you can't mix with crowds, et cetera? Yeah, and of course, with the COVID, um, I think that uh, if, uh, if a person is um, disabled and unable to leave the house, for one thing, that now so much is going on with Zoom and with that type of connection um, that there are classes to take. Um, there are all kinds of things going on on Zoom. So that's the area to take advantage of right there. And I think there are you know, um, groups, there are book groups online, there are all kinds of groups. So definitely that's one way to start um, for sure. And I think um, it takes, I think it takes time too. Uh, it can't it just not, oh, I'm going to take this class and now I meet all my best friends. Obviously, you know, it doesn't work that way, but it's a matter of persisting in kind of understanding that, yes, I need connections. So I will continue to, you know, through the social media and whatever else is available, depending on my situation, you know, I will uh, continue to look for um, like-minded folks that I can talk to um, perhaps on Zoom or perhaps by taking a class uh, and keep on until I meet, um, I make some new friends. Yeah. And I don't think I'm not saying, oh, that's easy, but I think it's like should be definitely a goal. OK. And now we can continue with the presentation. One of our uh, audience members said, uh, you know, it's a great flow of information. So. OK. Continuing. Um, OK, so. Um, so now I'm going to run, I might have to speed to the end or hopefully not, um, but we'll see. Um, so um, this, these two women are Bessie and Sadie Delaney, and they, after the age of 100, um, also I, I would have to say there are lots of memoir groups and people working on memoirs and writing together. And it go, a lot of it goes on, along, goes on, on Zoom at this point. So um, they um, wrote this wonderful book. I don't know if you've read it. Um, it was on the New York Times bestseller list and with Amy Hill Hearth. And so um, Sadie is the one on the right as you're facing her. And she was the survivor. Um, and she was 106 when she lost Bessie, who was 104 when she died. And so then she wrote a book called On My Own, also with her collaborator, Amy Hill Hearth. Um, and they, the, it, these are wonderful books and they talk about, um, um, well, uh, Sadie talks about grief and how you deal with grief, which is, you know, part of the, uh, part of dancing with the muse in old age is dealing with um, grief. Um, but, and they come up in several ways in the book, but um, they did exercises every morning. And at age 106, Sadie had this to say about some of her sedentary friends. Um, she said, some of our friends that are 20, 30 years younger come in here and tell me they're worried about me. But to tell you the truth, I think I look better than they do. <laughs> they come huffing and puffing up the steps and I'm thinking, I hope you don't die in my parlor. Um, <laughs> and so exercise is important, she says, and a lot of older people don't exercise at all. And the guideline is, I mean, there are federal guidelines, but the guideline um, if you're disabled um, is to move as much as you can. That's the guideline. So if you're in a wheelchair, like move your arms and like that. Um, okay. Um, so this is, um, of course, Anna Mary Robertson Moses. Um, 
and formerly grandma. And so um, Peter Sheldahl, the New Yorker critic who uh, recently died, um, he did a great review of her, of an exhibition of hers and suggested we stop calling her grandma, even though grandma Moses, you know, even though she of course called herself grandma Moses, but that was in a different <laughs> era. So anyhow, she's an example of someone who started painting in her seventies, as we know, um, but she's also an example of someone, which I, is actually not in the book because I learned it. I mean, I knew it, but I kind of thought it through after the book was done, um, who due to disability changed their medium. So she used to do these um, intricate embroideries where, I mean, they would be this, they would, be, they were big and they had um, roads and houses and little people and animals and fences and kind of like her paintings, but it was all embroidery and different colors and she would design them. And she got arthritis in her hands and couldn't, um, she couldn't manipulate the needle. So she took up painting and the rest is history. Um, and so I think that one thing that just so inspired me in writing this book is is so many of these people and I'm showing you just a very few of them um this is Kay walking stick and um she had this to say and I'll here's here's one of her she does a lot of triptychs I mean diptychs diptychs too diptychs um she says, I think art making is the visual history of our experience on earth. And this is a fuller way to talk about our lives here, our humanity, our existence, our planet. So um, that's Kay. And so her, her, her story, let me see if I can turn it back. Her story has a lot to do with um, losing her, suddenly losing her not very old husband. Um, and uh, about dealing with grief and elegy and, and how art is partly about elegy. So, um, and so as to not um, give the impression of all, all these elite artists, although some of them aren't elite at all, actually. Um, the, perhaps you probably know about the G's Bend quilters. Um, I love this quilt. I just think it's so gorgeous. Um, um, this um, is a small African-American community and it's in Alabama, isolated on three sides by the Alabama River. And the women in this community have been making quilts for generations and they have you know, produced countless patchwork masterpieces according to the New York Times. So that's an example of a community of a, a creative community. And I don't think they thought of themselves as creative. I doubt they used that word, but they were making, um, uh, you know, uh, bed spreads for their beds. Uh, but uh, they, had, uh, a very, they had a lot of intergenerational knowledge and um, communication, but they also had, and they had a very cohesive community. But they also had this idea that each person would make their own individual, uh, you know, quilt. That they they had the liberty to uh, make their own original design. So, um, here's a question, uh, maybe related to before when you were talking about people that uh, you know have arthritis or disab disability mm -hmm. or something. Uh, uh, Terry finished grad school at 59, and she got a job after two two year search working with many younger people. Tries to keep her brain active because her mother had dementia. Uh, however, her knees aren't good, and uh, she can't really um, exercise. She's put on weight. She's become depressed. She's single, no kids, but she's asking, uh, "Well, what do you do when your mind is still sharp, but you face physical limitations?" Yes. And again, um, I don't know if uh, you can find a trainer or some or a physical therapist to work with you because moving, even if your knees are no good and um, you're so um, 
it's like moving is so important to find ways to move and also to find support in moving. And maybe at the Y, I'm, you know, I'm not in New York, so I don't, and I don't know where you are either, but, but there are, there are senior centers, there are YMCAs and YWCAs, and there are people who can help you to learn how to move. I mean, it's, I don't think moving means that you have to go, it doesn't mean you have to join a gym and like, you know, go out like that. Um, it just means, um, you know, raising your arms, you know, uh, or, you know, turning or doing chair yoga. I mean, there's many uh, ways to move. And so, and that also, um, uh, it 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 brings company. If you get a um, a trainer or a uh, physical therapist or uh, at the senior center, there are free free things at the senior centers. So that's what I would um, suggest. That I think moving is really important, and it's good that your brain is sharp. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so let me see, where am I? Um, um, this is, um, so Carmen Herrera and, um, uh, she, um, uh, she worked on art her whole life. She's Cuban American. Um, and, um, so maybe that's why she was ignored for so long. But she kept working and kept working, and kept working and kept being ignored for decades. She moved from Cuba to New York at some point and she was still ignored. Um, and her, so her first one artist show was at age 69. Um, and, but she didn't sell any paintings at that show, but it was a show. So um, she sold her first painting at age 89. Um, and then finally, at age 94, the New York Times called her the hot new thing in painting. So finally, she's getting some recognition. And then at age 101, and she just died, um, she was, well, you can tell how old she was. Uh, um, she, so um, at age 101, she had a retrospective at the Whitney. And the director of the Whitney wrote that she had created a stunning body of work that places Herrera firmly in the pantheon of great post-war abstract painters. And so um, I think her lesson to me is persisting in her dream with very little outside encouragement. She just kept on and eventually uh, she was recognized. So that's her. And then, oh, and that's one of her paintings. She did these um, big um, abstractions. And this is, this is Violet Hensley. And um, her story is, um, she was an Arkansas fiddler wood carver, she grew up in a poor family. Um, her father taught her wood carving and her father made fiddles. Um, she got married at 18, she had eight children. Um, they actually, they left Arkansas to work as farm workers, as pickers in the Pacific Northwest actually where I am. And um, they did that for years and very hard life. She said it was a hard life and there was not much to sing about, so. Eventually they got home. She went back to making fiddles and back to fiddling. And the whole family is a musical family. And then the folk music revival of the 1960s came and, um, you know, and they, uh, they started to thrive uh, through that. So, um, and then here, if, if we're running short of time, be sure to tell me, because um, this is Noah Purifoy. And um, I want to read. So he is from Los Angeles, um, assemblage artist. 
And he, this is a kind of typical pattern in some way. I mean, he's, he was trained as an artist, but he's, and I shouldn't say, but he was trained as an artist and he spent his decades of his career um, in art education teaching. And um, let's see, page 102. And he, Governor um, Jerry Brown appointed him to, um, to what was it? It was the uh, California Arts, Arts Council, which meant also he spent the decade, um, you know, designing curriculum for schools and for prisons and pl places like that. And then he retired and to in order to go back to his own work at age 70. And but at that point, he could not um, afford to live in, in, in L.A. So. Um, a friend offered him 10 acres in the Joshua Tree High Desert, and he set up a trailer there and got to work. And this is, I want to read this um, passage about him. Um, Surrounded by trailers, busted out homesteading shacks, and small modern abodes, over the next 15 years, Purifoy transformed the barren parcel of desert on Blair Lane into one of art history's wonders punctuating the 10 acre site with more than 120 large scale sculptures. Composed largely of junk, Purifoy's environmental installation in Joshua Tree is his most lasting legacy as an artist. So that's another person who took what he had and made something of it. Um, okay. and you should he, give the five minute warning at this at this point. Oh, okay. And I'll just and, flip, and I'll give you a two if you like. <laughs> okay. So here are the dancers. I'm just gonna flip through the dancers. <laughs> this is Bill Trailer, um, which who was a you'll have to read the book. Bill Trailer was a, a very impoverished street artist in Alabama, and he was became known only after his um long after his death. And so I want to end with this. Now I can now go to Oliver Sacks, one of my favorite writers of all time. I adore Oliver Sacks. Um, and here's what he said about old age. First, he's talking about his father. Um, he said, my father, who lived to 94, often said that his 80s had been one of the most enjoyable decades of his life. He felt, as I begin to feel, not a shrinking, but an enlargement of mental life and perspective. One has a long experience of life, not only one's own life, but others too. One has seen triumphs and tragedies, booms and busts, revolutions and wars, great achievements and deep ambiguities too. One has seen grand theories rise only to be toppled by stubborn facts. One is more conscious of transience and perhaps of beauty. And then he talks about his own old age. I do not think of old age as an ever grimmer time that one must somehow endure and make the best of, but as a time of leisure and freedom, freed from the factitious urgencies of earlier days free to explore whatever I wish and to bind the thoughts and feelings of a lifetime together. And then um, do we, is there time for one more paragraph? <laughs> sure. Good. I could end there, but I'll, I'll read, oh. this is, these are my words. <laughs> these are my words now. Old age, it can be a freer time, a looser time, a more contented time. It can be a time of exploring, learning, reading, walking, thinking, conversing. It can be a time of creating, writing, painting, drawing, throwing pots, dancing, choreographing, sculpting, making collages, making video art, gardening, composing at one's own pace, as one is given to do, as one chooses to do. Old age can be and often is a time of freedom, productivity, creativity, and great happiness. Okay. And the name of the book is Dancing with the Muse. But it comes with more. There's more than that. Dancing with the Muse in old age. <laughs> okay. I was going to say in old age, but I thought there was a word. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for listening in. Thank you. <laughs>
Yeah, we have and uh, I think we have, we have uh, a few minutes uh, for some questions. But in the meantime, I'm putting her uh, website where you can find it. Uh, and she'll have links out to places that you can purchase the book, www.priscillalong.com. Well, let me just put HTTPS in front of it because that sent And you have to spell Priscilla link. correctly or else you'll get nowhere. <laughs> I-S-C-I-L-L-A long, right? Right, right, right. Dot com. There you go. And uh, if you'd like to um, find out about more uh, events that Coming of Age holds, uh, visit uh, pssuada.u. Let's start again. Visit pssusa.org slash newsletters, and you can find out uh, not only some interesting uh, news articles that are of interest to people 50 plus, but also um, about our events that are uh, coming up. And it only comes out monthly. So, uh, yeah. And uh, I do have one more question in the chat before we go. Ah, oh, it's not a question. It's a statement. <laughs> Oh, Priscilla's got it. Okay. Uh, answering it. Says, you know, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for and, coming. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you all for coming.